It's just after 7pm on December 26th, 2021, and 14-year-old Xavier Gonzalez is captured on surveillance footage at the Texaco petrol station on 730 West Walnut Street in Garland, Texas. He's there to purchase some tacos for his grandparents after returning to the city from their ranch only hours earlier. But ladies and gentlemen, in a sad case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, Xavier would never leave that Texaco alive and would never get to deliver those tacos to his grandparents because of a 14 14-year-old boy who wasn't even known to him. Yes, you heard that right, because Xavier happened to be in the same area of that gas station as two individuals who had an issue with the said 14-year-old boy. Again, he didn't know those two individuals either. It put a target on his back and he was sadly marked for death. Over a year on since the fatal mass shooting, a sentence has been handed down to one person involved in the case. The shooter, however, that 14-year-old, still hasn't been captured by law enforcement. Meaning then, at the time of recording, he's got away with it. Just because that's the status at the moment doesn't mean he'll never get caught. With various agencies involved in locating him, I doubt he'll be on the run for much longer. Somewhere down the line, it's almost guaranteed he'll be tracked down. Xavier Gonzalez was the life of the family. He was adored by many and hated by none. The 14-year-old boy kept his head in his books and joined his school's football team to avoid the many third-party influencers that could take him down the wrong path in life. Away from school, he was brought up around a loving family that wanted the best for him, and they got him working on his grandparents' ranch from an early age. He loved the ranch that much, he would tell everyone he owned it, and his grandparents were simply watching over the place for him. As you can see, he had a good head on his shoulders, and with experience on the ranch, working with machines, and doing construction with family, the opportunities later on in life, whether that be chasing a dream of becoming a professional football player, or something away from the spotlight, were there for the taking. Sadly, none of those dreams would ever come to fruition. There isn't much more background information on Xavier that we can dig up, so we'll fast forward the timeline to Christmas Day of 2021. Everyone headed over to the ranch, the usual. This Christmas, Xavier had made his grandma a new table that he had been working on in the days leading up to the holiday. In hindsight, it's something his grandma could hold close to remind her of her beloved grandson. All we know of Xavier's final moments is that it was spent with family, enjoying time with them, doing what he loved, living life on the ranch, and even bonding over hunting with his uncle. On December 26th, 2021, the family unit travelled from the ranch over to Garland, back to Xavier's home, to continue the gathering. As the evening drew close, Xavier was asked to go to the local Texaco gas station to grab some tacos for everyone. Being the person he was, he had no complaints and wrote down everyone's order. Moments later, 17-year-old Rafael Garcia and 16-year-old Ivan Noloya pull up to the Texaco in Ivan's uncle's white truck. The trio, along with Ivan's grandma, had been out for the day at a flea market where the grandma owned the store. Upon returning home, everyone was hungry and decided that they wanted something to eat. Everyone apart from Ivan wanted to grab some pizza. He said no because he had had some earlier on that day. So they went to go and grab that before making their way to the Texaco gas station on West Walnut Street, a decision that would sadly cost both Raphael and Ivan their lives. When arriving, Ivan made his way to order some tacos. Raphael stayed behind briefly as he lost his phone in the truck, but Ivan's uncle prompted him to go into the store because Raphael had said he wanted some items from there as well. When both are present in the shop, they go on to buy some smoke paraphernalia. Notice how throughout the surveillance footage, they pay no attention to Xavier.
December 26th, 2021 had been fairly usual for father-son duo Abel and Richard Acosta. They had enjoyed Christmas the day prior, but needed to head to North Park Shopping Center to trade in some cologne that Abel had received as a gift. So they did exactly that and did some general browsing before making their way home. As they were doing so, Abel received a text message from a friend asking if he wanted to meet up. And so he asked Richard to drop him off at the Firewheel Town Centre, another shopping complex, to meet up with said friend. Richard agreed, and Abel was dropped off. A few hours went by. Richard, by this point, had started to watch the Dallas Cowboys, and at around 6.30pm, he received a text asking to pick the pair up. He had some running around to do for his wife anyway, so why not kill two birds with one stone? Abel's friend had lived by a Kroger supermarket just off West Walnut Street, less than a mile from where the Texaco gas station is. After he was dropped off, Richard and Abel went to grab some groceries from the Kroger before finally making their way back home. For Richard, it meant he could continue watching the Dallas Cowboys play in peace. However, the trip wasn't done just yet. You see, around a month before the date in question, the 26th, Richard's wife had sadly miscarried and was having stomach complications, so she asked Richard to pick her up some Tylenol, a non-aspirin pain reliever. Although a text message was sent while he was in the Kroger, he didn't check his phone until he began driving away, so he opted to pull into the Texaco gas station, again less than one mile away. This is the moment the pair pull in and Richard gets out to buy some Tylenol. Up until this moment in time, we've gone over the timeline from the standpoint of Richard Acosta and what he would eventually testify to in court. I don't believe there's any reason to contest that portion of the timeline as evidence does match up with his story. But from the moment he walks out of the store and enters his vehicle, that, I believe, is to be contested. Although moving forward, we'll still continue to give you the timeline from Richard's point of view, you must take it with a pinch of salt. And we'll get into the prosecution's version of events when that time comes. When Richard got back into his vehicle, both him and Abel got into a brief conversation. Hey, what did those guys tell you? Nothing, why? Do you know them? Yes, I know them. What, those guys over there? Are you talking about the guy with the mullet? Yeah, it's those guys. I had my necklace stolen. They didn't steal it, but they know who did. Let me get out and speak to them. No, I want to go back and watch the game. If it's bothering you that much, I'll get you a new one. Less than a minute later, the pair look as if they're about to leave, but... Richard said a car blocked the exit, so he decided to swing his truck around to leave via the other exit. As he's doing so, Richard said that Abel had attempted to get out of the vehicle and he grabbed him by the scruff of his neck. The pair then got into a small scuffle, forcing Abel to take his t-shirt off. Richard's vehicle at that moment had passed by Ivan's uncle's truck and hit his wing mirror. He stopped briefly to see if Ivan's uncle would get out to say anything, but Ivan's uncle didn't because he thought it was an old drunk person. You see, he'd been playing games on his phone at the time and he just brushed it off. Richard's truck is then spotted pulling back around towards the store. The two are still having a heated conversation. So are you 100% that these guys know who stole your necklace? Yeah. Okay then, I saw them going into the smoke shop. Hurry though, because I want to go and watch the game. This is what happened next.
To sum up, Richard stated things got heated between him and Abel because Abel said that Raphael and Ivan knew about his necklace that had been stolen. After trying to stop him from confronting them about the incident, he allowed him to go inside but said he didn't know that he was about to open fire. The shooting caused the deaths of Xavier, Ivan and Raphael, whilst the taco chef was severely injured but he would go on to survive. 20 shots were fired and a little over 10 seconds after it started, it had ended. Abel ran to the truck, told Richard Richard to drive, and the pair drove away from the scene. Describing those moments, Richard stated that Abel was shaken up, and after asking what had happened, he said that someone had started to shoot while he confronted Ivan and Raphael. After a short drive home, Abel ran up to his room, locked himself away, and refused to eat. A few hours later, according to Richard, Abel had fled the home. As of when I'm recording this video, in February of 2023, Abel's whereabouts are still unknown. Richard continued his daily life following the shooting, opting to go to work instead of continuing to hunt for his son or going forward to police to say that something had happened and he may have information regarding shots going off at the Texaco gas station. However, in the evening, he received a text message from a friend telling him that a CCTV still was circulating in the news via the police in connection with a mass shooting. So, he handed himself in. A 14-year-old boy was arrested in connection with the incident. This came as the result of Raphael's sister, Maria, receiving some messages from a fake Instagram page. Your brother dead as fuck. It's your fucking fault. SB50, Northside Blood for Life, a local gang within Garland. I'ma die behind that. Y'all ain't active like gang. Police contacted Instagram for information about the account and the person was tracked down. The 14-year-old boy was known to Raphael and Ivan, but it wasn't able. In other words, he was just an online troll. He was subsequently let go without charge. Richard, on the other hand, would go on to be charged with capital murder. So the facts of the case aren't in dispute. Rather, did Richard act as a getaway driver for his son who had just committed a mass shooting? We've gone over Richard's point of view, but let's take a brief look at what the prosecution had to say. One obvious factor to take into account is how didn't Richard see that Abel had a handgun with an extended clip? There was no way it could have been concealed. The prosecution also argued, why didn't Richard park the vehicle up? Why did he have his foot down on the brake the whole time during the shooting? They say it was like that so he could speed away from the scene after the shots were fired. Richard also claimed to have ducked down when the shots were fired. If that was the case, then why didn't his foot move from the brake as he did so? According to phone data analysis, sometime after the shooting, Richard's phone had been traced to Fort Worth, a rough hour drive away from Garland. Richard claimed that he made the trip to search for Abel as Abel told him earlier on in the day he wanted to go and visit a cousin who lived there, but Richard didn't want to take him. The prosecution stated that this trip was made to get rid of evidence and destroy it. The most damning evidence against Richard came as the result of a phone conversation with a spiritual doctor. He claimed he spoke to the doctor to receive a reading about Abel's whereabouts, but when police traced this doctor down as part of the investigation, the phone call contents were repeated to police. He told me he wanted me to help him relocate his family get rid of his phone and destroy the gun. He had also told me that the reason Abel shot the teens was because Abel's younger brother Marcus had been bullied by Raphael, meaning then that the necklace story was bogus. <laughs> We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Richard Acosta Jr., guilty of the offense of capital murder as charged in the indictment. You may be seated. Does either side wish to have the jury hold at this time? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, I'm going to call your name. Or actually, I'm just going to go one by one and ask you whether or not this is, in fact, your verdict, okay? We'll start here on the first row. Is this your verdict? This is my verdict, ma'am. Okay. Is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. 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 Is this your verdict? Yes, Your Honor. We'll go back to the second row. Is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Is this your verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Is this your verdict? Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Is this your verdict? Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this concludes your service. Customarily in Dallas County, myself, as well as the attorneys, like to talk with you and get your opinions and feelings about things as to whether or not we can change or modify and make things better down here at the courthouse. And so if you do have time to stick around in the jury room, we'd like for you to do so. Plus, I'd like to come back in person and thank you for your service. 
And the rules that I've given you are now lifted. You're free to discuss this case with anyone if you want, no one if you choose. It's completely up to you as to how you want to handle that. Um, but if you do have time, you can stick around in the back. I'd love to chat with you. Otherwise, you are free to go. Thank you again so much for your service. We do not have done this All right, my joy. So it seems then that the jury saw straight through Richard's story. And although I've gave a brief overview of what was said, when you watch his testimony in full, you can see there are holes in his story. I'll link that in the description for anyone who wants to watch. As it stands at the moment, it's firmly believed that Abel is in Mexico with family members, although that can't be confirmed. Will he ever be caught? There's a high possibility that he will. Will it be anytime soon? I believe so, but we never know.